Right, here we go. Hi, All right, I'm here again, Wave of Action UK, another chat um, discussing matters, and um, we're going to start with Matteo. Hello. So, um, you know, I thought we'd start off the conversation with something quite general and something that everybody can, everybody um, knows about and has encountered at least once in their life, which is the NHS. And it's um, soon to potentially be privatisation. Now, um, I, this topic has been quite um, quite a big one and quite a personal one for me. Um, not because I, I, I have a huge need for the NHS more than anybody else, but just because um, I have quite a lot of um, friends and so forth that are in America. And um, from what I hear from them and so forth, they always praise what Britain has in the NHS. They always talk about what Britain has with regards to the NHS. And they say that the one thing you don't want to be is like America when it comes to healthcare. Some people could argue you don't want to be like America for a lot of things, but specifically for healthcare is something they definitely don't want to see. Because I mean, a lot of them and know of people, and I know of people that have actually had their families gone into bankruptcy simply because of a broken leg, for instance, because the hospital bill is so big that they just can't handle it, and the wages they just can't handle it. And I'm not talking about poor people; I'm just talking about middle class people as well. People that are on middle income families, you know, where they have two of them both oh. working on the comfortable salaries. If you get a bill from the hospital in America, you are unlikely to go into, into bankruptcy because of the sheer amount of costs that the hospital ends up incurring because of that broken leg and so forth. And we, I think we don't know how thankful we are. We don't know how, how lucky we are, sorry, to have something like the NHS that if you have a cold, if you have a broken leg, if you've Anything that's happened to you in regards to your health, yes, the serve may be slow at times, but at least everybody has it. Everybody has the right and the ability to actually go down there and have something seen to. And I mean, yes, we may complain that the the lines might be too long and so, but I mean, Jesus, we have one of the only decent working healthcare systems in the world. And at the moment, if we if the government carries on the way they're going, that's going to disappear, and we're going to have something like America. Or, I mean, some countries in Europe, I mean, I'm Italian and I have experience with the Italian healthcare system, and I can tell you it's definitely not something you want either. They yeah. have a, a semi-private healthcare system as well. So, I mean, just talking slightly closer to home in regards to Europe, I mean, there are people in Italy that are in awe of the healthcare system we have. They are in awe of the healthcare system that we have because it is a place where people can go, no matter what wage range you have, no matter what income you have available to you, no matter how much money you have, you can be seen to. And that's something that I think is incredibly special, and not hardly any other. I don't think I don't think there is another country in the world that actually has something as unique as we do. And I think it's a sad shame that we're gonna have we're gonna throw this away if we don't do something. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I agree on that. And and then we've got to take into account also if you've got um uh, things like um when you get to a stage where a hospital insurance company who who does health insurance turns around and says they won't cover your child on that kind of insurance for leukemia that's when I think things will hit home a bit harder than and and then it's too late obviously at that stage um, to do that um, it's such it's such a, I think it's the worst decision that we could actually allow to go through at the minute that that's possibly the one that people aren't grasping big enough. They think that insurance is this, that, the other, but we can only take a look at America, the USA, and, and see the damage that having a selector. It, it depends on what job you've got and how much money you've got to how much you um you you sort your healthcare is worth, and that wouldn't it'd be like a vet you turning into a vet. Mm -hmm. I'm on break in America. And it cost her like nine hundred dollars just for them to stick a plaster on it. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I've heard of families, for example, in America, that have had to spend. I mean, their their child has gotten hurt for whatever reason. They've had to spend their whole college fund. And bearing in mind, in America, university is a lot of money. Mm. They've had to spend their whole college fund and extra to deal with their child's issue. And that means that child is now healthy, but they can't get a degree. And in America, if you don't have a degree, it's even more orientated than, than we are in this country with regards to um, university qualifications and so forth. And people shouldn't have to choose between having their leg fixed and then getting an education, or having their leg fixed and having their, fa their family end up in impending poverty for the rest of their life just because of that. And uh, I don't know. Just I, if you're speaking about leukemia as well. If you get, have a leukemia and so forth, 
American insurance companies won't cover it. They, there is a clause saying they won't cover those kind of diseases. Exactly. So if you have that kind of stuff, you are, pardon me, but you are screwed if you do not have that in America. You are in serious, serious trouble. Yeah. And we and we have to take note that if if we're going to take on this kind of Americanized um, NHS, Americanized healthcare, then we need to take a look at those incidents. Even just Google it, Google it, and see what you know. They've let um, people die just because they can't afford to um, healthcare. That's not human. That's not human. That's not right. Um, and our NHS prevents that from happening. Mm. I mean, another one, of course. I mean, there are, for example, you know, sort of dark jokes of, of billboard and stuff of, of um, you see the um, ambulance workers holding a, um, holding a credit card machine, saying, "Well, before we pick you up, your your broken leg or whatever you have, you have a credit card. Can we see your insurance?" That's not a joke, and I know it's hard. And the thing is, it's hard to grasp in Britain because you say, "Well, you know, I'm ill. I got a problem. I just go down to my GP." You know, it's simple. Yeah, of course, yeah. that's what happens. We used but, to it. It was exactly. We are so. It's almost like we're we're so used to be able to speak our minds. If we suddenly went to a country like Saudi Arabia, for instance, we wouldn't be used to that kind of level of of oppression. In America, on the other hand, you're not the kind of used to being of that level of alone because you are actually alone in all in the realest of senses when it comes to your health. Mm. If you have an issue, you have to deal with it yourself unless you have the money to get to get a doctor. And that is, real, that is the reality of it. And an ambulance service in America is private. So if you get picked up by an ambulance, expect to have a bill for it. If you get picked up by an ambulance in the UK, you, won't ha you don't have that yet. I say yet because, I mean, the Conservatives are planning to do it. And they it are is on the cards. Privatising it through the virtual. You know, there's lots of little things that we didn't used to have to pay for that are now sneaking in. And then you've got, I don't know if you read the story about the... I don't know, she's 80 or 19 year old woman in that village where the doctor just randomly wrote to a load of patients and struck them off their books to make room for new patients. And you have to ask yourself, when a doctor's surgery is doing that, how much of that is you know, disabled or elderly? How much was it that they thought, well, they take up too much time, we just get shot of our old pensioners and just have like young people? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, exactly. You got to wonder. Well, if that's the case, I mean, health is shouldn't be. I mean, there are a lot of things that you can consider a right, you can consider a duty, and you consider something that sometimes in the society we have to pay for. But I mean, surely healthcare above others. I mean, just just your right to live a healthy life should be a right, not something you must pay for. I mean. Agree it's almost like self. It's almost like safety. I mean, if you can pay for healthcare, what would stop anybody from saying you got to pay for security? I.e., the police now becomes privatized. You know, where do you go? Where do you go from there? The police. But if there won't be any public services. They will all be put out to tender to the highest bidders. And on. All right. Sorry okay. about that. Google's <laughs> kicked us again. <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but um, I think as as we were saying, yeah, I think um, I don't think enough pressure, not not just enough pressure, I don't think enough awareness or care has been put into um, what's actually going on with the NHS because it is it is becoming quite quite urgent to the fact that the Conservatives have openly said that they are gonna privatise it in 2015 after the election if they remain in power, which frankly I think they will be. Um, yeah. On top of that, I mean, they've already started to privatise it in places like Manchester. I mean, they have um, oh, the ambulances service is already done by a private organisation. They got another private company that's been done for fraud about four or five times, which they're consistently rehiring for whatever reason. So it's um, you know, it's it's, it's happening already to a, to an extent. But I think the the biggest worry and the fact that we can still hold on to it is that we don't have to pay for it still. What it is still a national institution, so. What do you think is going to be the best method to save it at the stage we're at now? <sighs> Honestly, I the best. I mean, protesting and so forth is one thing. I mean, I think the best thing that's going to do is um, I, I'm I'm a bit of a believer in the sense that we have these institutions. We have, for the moment, the ability to vote, the ability to speak up without being shot at. Um, for however long that carries on is 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 another question altogether. 
I think the best option is first of all don't vote for the Conservatives vote for yeah. anybody else I mean anybody else I'm not going to start promoting Labour or the Greens but just anybody else Yeah. and start writing to your MP because some of them do listen believe it or not because I mean there are some good MPs out there no, and just get to the, just get into the street. I mean, there's these the um the people's assembly right to them. I mean, it's it's I think it's all about communication, and it's all about any. I think it's, this is an issue that affects everybody. No matter how no matter how healthy you are, I'm sure you visited the NHS for a cold or whatever else when you were a child. Even you, everybody, this is effect. It's not something like workers' pensions, which if you're a student doesn't quite affect you. It's not like if you're you know, a specific worker. So, for example, teachers' rights affect only teachers. This is everybody. This is something that affects your health. Everybody has yeah. health issues at God one stage. Bit, you know, home. like something that happens to our children. You know, that that's not really expected. But we all have parents and grandparents that we all love dearly, and they've already made it quite clear that they're willing to sacrifice our old if, if our old can't afford to pay for their medication. That's without a privatised. NHS. That's you know a suggestion that they've knocked around as a possibility. You know, and and we all should be taken to the streets for the vulnerable that can't do it themselves, and, yeah. and really pushing. I don't know. I don't know how you make them listen nowadays because they just seem to do what they want. They don't seem to want to listen. But just do what it's we not can. Not You've got the. the TTIP as well, you know, there's there's uh, things for the NHS in that. You know, they will be definitely prioritised through that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the TTIP, for example, I think if it's the same thing that we're talking about, it will give governments the, the right to sue. I mean, it will give corporations the right to sue um, governments if their laws infringe their profits. Yeah. How insane is that? Yeah. So Government. if you were to raise minimum wage and you, a corporation could sue the government for raising minimum wage, uh, how, are you not going to get any increase in minimum wage if that comes in? Because no what, government would be able to put that bill. I mean, what that is doing, I mean, that is the coup de grace almost of privatisation in the sense that if that goes through and it seems bleak frankly that will destroy any rights to go i mean again it's it's all about this discussions we had i think a couple couple of um couple of these sessions ago about how it's not actually government's fault because they don't have any power anymore they're just the yes men of corporations yeah yeah and yeah. whatever little power i mean at the moment some politicians out there are fighting for the rights of people and there are but mm. the little rights they have and the little power they have is going to be stripped away as soon as the ttip bill goes through as soon as, that, as soon as our treaty goes through, um, political parties turning almost into activists lately. Have you noticed that? <laughs> I, I, I have to agree that um, I have to say that so many parties are joining us on these marches now and actually standing in support of us, which goes to show me that they realise they need us, and they they mm -hmm. know. Exactly. You, you look at the Green Party, they've sat in the background for a long time. A lot of their things, you know, are, are very along the same lines. But I think they're starting to realise they need the people. This isn't going to happen without the people. And they're possibly coming round to a way of thinking that this whole set, this system is, is corrupt. And I've noticed a lot of them. You've got Green Party members, you've got Socialist Party members, you've got all sorts um, marching with us and doing... And doing uh, activities with us. You've got the main two, obviously, that sit three. Sorry, that sit there at the top and are, burr, 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 burr. yeah, an ivory tower of sorts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you, you've generally the lower sort of ones of the of the um, pirate party has always been there as well. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, and, uh, yeah. What, what do you reckon to the rumours with the TTIP? I've just like got it back up so I could check it, and um, that it might be followed by a military. Treaty, which would focus on defending the free trade zone through a joint US UE defence force. I mean, I, I'm I'm a little bit sceptical in the sense that anything to do with the US has always resulted in something negative. Mm. In the sense that I'm sorry to summarise this, but if you look at all all the biggest tragedies in human history, in recent human history rather have been in some way linked to US business. Yes. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, you have... 
I mean, I look at it and I think, you know, like, surely our military, I know that they do a lot of things that aren't great, but to defend corporate interest, to just basically change the law so that, you know, a certain part of the military would be defending um, trade free zones. I think and, that's, and, that's criminal, frankly. I yeah, mean, the, it, it, if I was a British soldier, and I never will be in a million years fight for what, what whatever this is, whatever this place has become, I would resign immediately, thinking, "Well, I'm not. I didn't. I didn't stand up to fight for a for a company to make more money." I mean, I I, I just think I don't well, know. Look at the words of what army is supposed to be, what an army is exactly the job they are supposed to do in the old terms of they are fighting for their. They are the people's army. The oaths that they make. Same as the police. The police are yeah, supposed the to Yeah, the oaths that these people swear. Are they yeah. going to change it so they're swearing it to corporations? Well, well I mean, I, can I, I, pledge, I pledge an honour to Boots that, that <laughs> all fight for the right that they can stay in Britain Talk without paying them. their taxes. I pledge allegiance. Actually, that could be a load of. That could be quite a load of good videos, frankly. It could, mm. couldn't it? it could, I yeah. pledge allegiance to fight for the sole profit of each company to screw over as many people as humanly possible in their lifespan. And then when the World Cup comes around, I promise that I will move all those people who are ragged and homeless and been evicted from their homes and I will remove them with heartless thoughts in mind on the basis that this is for a corporation. I mean, think of, think of these corporations. I mean, these poor bastions that make only a couple of million a year and, and most probably more now. Billions, I think, now. I mean, think of these people. I mean, they have to protect their assets somehow from the greedy poor. You know, it's, 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 yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a must. You know, they, they, need, they need their army. God, yeah. you, you, sort of, you sort of think, you just sort of thinking, you, you sort of wonder how more people aren't outraged by this. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think that's one of the secret. We don't know, you know, the things that we do know about the TTIP and our leaks. You know, nothing, they, they, everyone goes on about transparency, but it's a one way transparency. We're expected to allow them into our homes, to spy on all our data, collect everything. But these investigations that they seem to do at Parliament and these agreements that they seem to make and, and all the legislations that they bring in, there is no transparency their way. Mm -hmm. Sure, uh, democracy is a hundred percent transparent on both sides. They, they could just slap a they could just slap a order on it saying that no public no public uh, discussion or anything over it or case for what ten fifty a hundred years they do what mm -hmm. they want double lane hundred years. Yeah, I mean, I, it, it's to the point where I gone. No. For me, I don't mind didn't say anything. All right, sorry. Um, no, I mean, I think it's to the point where it's. I mean, it, I'm sorry, but I, I, I'm going to have a little bit of a rant about um, about a little bit of ignorance here as well from 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 the people's part because I mean, I'm sorry, but it is not that secretive. It is not. You you can claim secrecy to a point, but I mean, how do we know about this? Because we yeah. care enough to research. So I'm sorry, but that is not an excuse anymore. Maybe before the internet it was, but all you have to do is go online, type in TTIP, and there are hundreds of thousands of articles on there. And I'm not accepting, sorry, that, oh, I didn't know about this, to the be an option anymore, because that just means you don't oh, care enough. No, in fact, the fact that the activist articles are at the top goes to show that the information they've got on how bad it is, rather than the articles produced for the actual TTP, right, this TTP, GIP, whatever, you, you'd have to go all the way down the bottom to find out what their sort of agenda is on it, because it's been overrun by people who, who know what their agenda is and what they're doing. So the information, you're right, the information's out there, but a lot of what happens in today's society, the bad racism and fascism, it's all down to ignorance. They say no different from lack of knowledge. It's down to not wanting to learn it or not finding the time or putting the effort into to understanding that. It's different if you have heard nothing about it mm -hmm. and you're not in these circles. These are the people I feel that need more help. You've got elderly that can't get online. You've got people that don't have access to internet where they haven't got the funds and things um, but if they've got the access to the internet I'm sorry it's got to the point where there's no way they can miss this movement mm, I, mean, I mean I'm sorry I, I think it's down to the point where it's actually um, 
people have to start taking the blame slightly for or the for 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 the lack of ignorance. Because yeah. it's a matter of, I mean, for God's sake, we have the internet. You can type in the word NSA and come up with hundreds of thousands of things again. You can type in anything to do with what is going on in the world. All you've got to do is spend a little bit of time. And I think it's a sad revelation of the way, of how things have gotten to the point where we care more about what a celebrity is wearing on Tuesday as opposed to what our kids are going to have to face because of our inability to even care a little to go online and check out some things. And I think that is that is shockingly terrible mm, yeah, about yeah. it and that's partly people because of our educational saying, system yeah people keep saying oh they're asleep they're asleep or oh, in the first place I find being awake or wake up and the term sheep I find it really derogative anyway I don't think it's a good term to use but we were saying yeah, that what, what how do you class being awake are we actually as awake as we think we are? I, d I think there's different variety of variations of of what knowledge you've got. It's, it's like I was I said earlier was that um, in a world so full of knowledge, we we're all limited to how much each of us can take in. So we're we're never going to be awake to the point where everybody knows everything that's going on and everything. So it, to a certain extent, some of us are semi-conscious and some of us are out cold. You know, there's a long way to go. We don't know what kind of conspiracies have done, been done against us or what the future holds, you know, or what the best ways forward are. That's how collectively we can come together, share ideas and grow. But, you know, when you're talking awake and asleep, you kind of, it's, it's awake, it, it's semi-conscious and conscious, uh, unconscious, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, you yeah. No, I mean, you're right, it's just... Go on. Go on. Me? I think Kay was going to say you're going to talk at the same time. Got something yeah, Kay? I was going to say, did you want to move on to your one then? <laughs> but if it's not oh, finished, moving on. on. Just... Yeah. Yeah, um, I think we should move on. <laughs> so, what I was thinking was um, talking about, like, when things resonate with us on a spiritual level and um, how if we're awakening um, consciously are we um, holding ourselves back by focusing on negative rather than finding ways of protest that maybe stimulate positives in us like gardening, you know, guerrilla gardening or um, the free shops that people set up and run or bartering systems or a local farm, anything that, you know, maybe you're an artist and you want to do some kind of political, um, like Banksy, you know, go out graffiti somewhere, living graffiti with the moss or something like that. Is protesting keeping us in a state of fear? So we're constantly reading, oh my God, the NHS might be privatised and oh my God, they're going to bring in these laws, that laws. Is that actually holding us back? on a paradigm shift because we're constantly living in a state of fear rather than raising human consciousness to a level where we are more focused on things that make us happy and washing our hands of things that don't. Mm -hmm. Like non-compliance. Is that the way forward for protesting or is just protesting work? Mm, I mean, just to say, I guess, um, my piece on this. I do think that protesting. I mean, the trouble with protesting is well, it's not really a trouble. Is that protesting as an act is an is an act of anger. You know, that's that's what. Pro I mean, you're protesting not because you're happy. You're protesting because you're annoyed that something's happening in government. You don't like it. So the whole point of a protest is to economically cripple the city you're in to give the government a statement because obviously all they care about is money and economics. So you hurt them in money and economics to the point where okay, damn, enough people care about this. I can't keep going the way I'm going, so I'm going to have to change it. So yeah. I guess the act of protesting itself is is in a is a negative act for a, for some for a positive move forward. In a sense that you are acting in anger because that's the only way a government's going to listen nowadays. If you attack, if you act in anger against something economic, then again, I guess it's a matter of um, well, what about the whole of activism activism in general? What about instead of just yelling at these people saying I want a different society why don't you go out and create your own society and forget this one because you are a human being on the planet earth this system is something that people created to live in a certain way if you don't like it move on and go to something else 
And when enough of us do that, there will automatically be a shift. Yeah, I mean, think because this is exactly what... Think it more. Mm. Mm. It wouldn't be so scary to people. You know, yeah. they'd see that there was somebody built a rabbit, a, a hobbit hole somewhere, and they're living quite happily without council tax and bills and work. So yeah. In that way. But it's like, how do you manage not to focus your attention on things that maybe don't uplift you, like the NHS, because they are so important. You need that information at the same time. I mean, there yeah. are ways, and... I think this is important why, we, why it's so important to study history because this has already happened before. I mean, think before capitalism, there was feudalism and a load of rich barons and capitalists, industrialists, didn't like the fact that the royals had all of the power, had all of the say, so they decided to create another system and they did, which is the system we live under today. They just decided to hell with it and they started to create their own system and eventually, once enough industrialists and stuff have moved off the kings and royals decided actually we need these people and then the system shifted because they were in need of the capitalists instead of the other way around because they're the ones that made the money in that system. So it's happened before so it can happen again. I guess what needs to happen is almost like a split in society where you move away from it but you still can at least keep a link in within what's going on because if you ignore society that's also quite negative because you can't just block yourself out of it. No. Until you think like that happening now then like we're having a shift into because I do feel that protesting and, um, and the sharing of this information is important to raise awareness because that we've got the gift of the internet we may as well unit, use it but do you think possibly this is the point we've come to now where we need the shift of the direction we're going in now of um, actually showing people this is how we've, we've told people people are aware we've just stated just then that possibly now we're hitting ignorance because people are getting to a point where they're like yeah what are you going to do about it because nothing else is working well this is what I'm going to do I'm going to bugger off over there I'm going to create my own community and I'm going to make this work for myself um, and I think the, prob the problem is I think people do want to do that, but the opportunities are so difficult to move away from the, um, the, the way that the government has set up um, our system. They've made it incredibly hard for us to move away and be, like say, like the feudalists and how they moved away from the kings and queens. Maybe the shift is becoming it's a little bit more difficult than we kind of want it to be, mm. you know, possibly. I think I mean, it depends. Go on. Go on. I think so when you break it down, all as it is is a change of mind for the mm -hmm. majority of the population, and then you'll have success. Without uprising, without violence, without things, if you can reach enough people to be pissed, that are pissed off enough with the system that they want change, it's, it's not beyond the rounds of possibility that you can get it just with change of opinion. Mm. I mean, in a, in a very, very practical sense, because I think it is true that people are to the point where they're annoyed with also the protesters because they're saying, okay, well, you've yelled enough that you don't like it. What is your alternative? And I think in a very, very practical sense, what the movement needs as such is a load of people with very little to lose that are able to set up an, another community as such to show people exactly how it's done. And it needs to be people that want to very, that have very little to lose simply because, let's be honest, if you set up a system and it works, the powers that be are going to become very, very nasty. That's just the way things are. That's just the way things, that's just the way things are going. And they're only nice to you at the moment because we're following the rules. Well, some of us anyway. Yeah. And what I'm saying is that what we actually need is a group of people that are willing to do this and sh create another society. And also, there's also another practical reason that in America, for instance, there are groups of individuals that are setting up little villages of sorts where they're just in their own community creating you know using products that are within their community growing their own locally and doing everything within themselves without a need of money the only problem with that yeah but if you've noticed it's under a very it's under an availability kind of um, status so that you have to contact them and then you have to do an interview then you have to show what you can put towards this thingy but there are people around like you've said it's going to be the it's the most vulnerable society that have nothing to put into this they have no skills to put into it they can't just get up and take their kids and move over to this community unless they're guaranteed some form of security so 
you, you've got these working farms and things that are running, but they're not they're not uh, attainable for people who are physically stuck in a situation. If you've got a young mother and she's um, stuck with a part-time job, can't get anything elsewhere, she's literally living off of the tax credits. And same with an elderly person, they're just stuck living off that. That would mean giving up their money, moving to this community and putting into things. But they, they there's the, that worry of, what will happen to my kids? Are my kids going to be all right in this community? Am I going to move away, give up everything, and then the community is going to fail? Mm. Do you I got mean, no security for the people who are actually being affected by this to go to? There's no op opt out of society. This is what I always think. You know, we're, we're born into this society, right? No one's asked me before I was born. <laughs> you know, do I want a prime minister? Do I yeah. want me and all of that? Yeah. And in this system, there is no opt out. The clause. You'd have to have money to be in a situation to get the land to even contemplate a, a, a an off the grid thing. And, and how much of the land do you actually own, yeah. really? Because if they wanted to get it back off you, I'm sure they would. Yeah, like Dale Farm, for but, example. Yeah, yeah. There was a place up north. It's somewhere. illegal to collect rainwater, so it wants a yeah, thing. Like that. I mean, there's a the thing about it. Go on. Sorry. There's a place up north, and they brought some land, and they couldn't get planning permission to build the houses, but then they really campaigned, and they, they as long as they built them, you know, like hobbit holes, part of the earth, and they had no amenities like water or electricity hooked up to them, they were, they were allowed to build houses, and they, they have an eco-village there, I can't remember the name of it, and there's, I think there's another one in London. There's one in Wales. The one in London's quite mad because it's like this micro little place and it's behind just like big uh, boards. <laughs> it's like a triangle of boards and in the middle of it, all the big buildings around it is a, a little eco village. Oh wow, that's amazing. Yeah, but, um... it's just, it looks like a building site with the boards up around the outside so they're obviously trying to hide it. <laughs> <laughs> I would. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, because obviously some, some real estate is going to get hold of that and then that'll be the end of that. Then you just kick him out eventually, um, especially because they're, they're in London. But I mean, also it's a, it's a place of, of, of geographical availability. I mean, in America, for example, you can just pick up and leave, go in the middle of the Midwest and nobody's going to bother you because the government, ha don't, the government doesn't know half the stuff that's going on in their own country. Whereas in Britain, because we're so small, everything's so compact. Yeah. That it's a lot, it is, I mean, physically just a lot harder to do anything here. Just because all the land is partially, I mean, don't forget that all the land is owned by the Queen and the Royals. I found the best that. way to deal with that, I live on the border of a county, and what I do is it's still in reach to the kids' schools and stuff like that, and what I do is I, I move from county to county, and I've possibly never stayed in, in one house for more than a year, and the kids stay at the same school. They have the same friends, the same sort of areas, but that county line is just right near where I live, so I can hip hop, hip hop, hip hop. Once you're off that council's books, they fuck. They don't know where you are. They're like, what, where have they gone? They write you a few letters, and then they're just like, there's another one gone. And then you start fresh in that new county, and then it takes a while for them to get build up their like profile of what you should be doing, what you need. Move back to the other county. Because they, then they can't get a grip on you in the way of where they plant you into that that kind of um, you know I just I just flip and hop and they they kind of lose they lose place of where I am and what I'm sort of doing and I I just don't like to be tagged down by them personally it's like no I'll go where I want and if you bring me a rule that I don't like I'll just fucking move to the next county again I actually border on three counties. But it's about 10 miles out for the last one, and that didn't work too well because we were driving to the school. It was like 10 miles every morning, and it, but we stick to the two now. <laughs> but I mean, you know, it's, 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 about, it's about availability and possibility as well. Yeah. Because, I mean, let, let's take the TTP, um, the TTIP, sorry, as an example. If, say, I mean, even if that law went through and 80% of the world wanted to live in another society, and they did. Mm -hmm. Who cares? I mean, in the end, the TTP, the TTIP is only a piece of paper if nobody else cares about it. Realistically, it's only a piece of paper. It's the weight of the belief that that piece of paper has that's the problem. Yeah. And if we started to hold the same kind of beliefs, and I mean, and then also there's the other argument of um, 
you know, so if you don't want to abandon the society because there is so much built around it, you could, I mean, in Britain, for example, we forget that we're not under the laws and statutes that these governments are pushing for. We're under common law. Yeah. And anybody that yeah. knows a bit about common law, for example, you don't actually have to pay any road, any road fine, just to give you an example, any parking ticket, because you have the right to park wherever you want, as long as you put a sticker that, I can't remember what, exactly what it says, but you can look it up quite easily. There, there is um, quite a few people, because the common law, the, the actual law on, on driving, to drive is to do the commerce, it's not to travel. You know, you, you have to be involved in commerce, the legal definition to drive. So they, that's how they, they say that they're, they're travellers, they're not... Yeah, you travel, um, you, you're not driving, you, I'm travelling. travelling. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. kind of gets it out of the law. But we're going to... Um, but, if they, but with common law and Magna Carta, that just again shows, you know, we had certain rights that were protected. That they just amend they them and change the budget, them without right? our consent. Magna Carta. They still and, and the budget that goes into it. But yeah, they've they've like repre they've repelled a lot of it. A lot of it they shouldn't. You know, that was a an agreement between um, sovereign and state, not parliament and state, and that they shouldn't really have been able to have touched that. And whether you can argue whether they're legit in touching it, but you know, I don't think you'd ever win that argument, they've changed the, the bits that they don't want in it and that's that. But it's like the, the, the Tories have yeah. got a consultation at the moment for a new um, Magna Carta, should we have one, but is that going to take us away from the court to human rights? I think so. And you know what's shocking about all of that to begin with? I mean, first of all, um, actually, if you look at the, have you ever heard of the reset? Campaign. Yes. Yeah, yeah. They are. Yeah. I mean, they're doing amazing work, and a lot of what they're saying is actually that a lot of the laws are that these part these parliaments have actually put in are actually illegal, according yeah. to original British rights and laws. And what I find is a bit of a joke is that if you look at MPs nowadays, they sort of act like they're one of the people. They are one of us, even though they have millions in the bank, etc. And the Magna Carta was made by lords, barons, dukes, and so forth who weren't one of the people. They were more than that. They, they openly said that they weren't. They were part of royalty, but they didn't like the way the sovereign, as you said, was treating the British people and themselves. And we had better rights from what they created than what our government creates now. Which well, I think I think is almost like a bit of a joke, frankly. It is really. Yeah, they just corroded it. Barbaric background. Yeah. What, I mean, um, it is considering we come from a very barbaric background. Yeah, yeah. We attain to I mean, more and with movement like that is is less civilized. And they're very doing hard. a consultation with on this new Nakata thing, and you can sign. We've put a link on Wave for those that want to take part, and we should, you know, try and change it, have our opinion, but whether it be listened to is another thing. I've sat on lots of consultations. I don't know how many other people have. But, you know, like with the council and things like that, just to see what goes on there. And they pay you, well, the council will pay you like £7.50 an hour. They put on a huge spread of food that was way more than the people there and they had all drinks and tea and coffee. And uh, They told you basically what they thought and what they wanted and led you down the garden to their way of thinking. That, that you were in no way involved in the initial outset of ideas or the actual shaping of anything, that, that's already done. It, the, the consultation is just the, the practice of how we sell this to the masses. Mm. Yeah. And, and, and pointless. Yeah. Mm. And, and to be honest, the fact that the council, I mean, I said to the council at the time, I said, the fact that you'll pay me £7.50 a year to sit here and be part of the town planning thing, it's disgusting because I should be here free. And you shouldn't just be able to waste our money on all that food and, and paying people to be here to listen to your like, spiel. Because that's from our council tax. You know, that's not what I pay my council tax for. No. It, it's not like if they had a consultation on fracking, the people consulting on fracking for the council will all be pro-frackers and it will be pushing their agenda. It won't be impartial. There is no consultation mm. in you know, gauging opinion, really. 
But that's what that's not what consultations are about anymore. Consultations are about proving what the government said. But it's just about strengthening what they're saying. You know, they're saying, okay, you know, we've done these consultations. These people agreed, so obviously it must be right. If in the consultation people don't agree, then they will just forget about it and they won't even publish it. But the there's times where we've gone along and we've ignored that, so we've we've allowed we've allowed them to pass this through. Um, but now that's what I think. Even though it, it, it's right that we're on the wrong paradigm, we are promoting things that are bad. But we're also at that time flagging up things where people are now like, no, I'm not going to do that. The water cannons, for instance, they stormed the building. They they went in there. They're like, no, this isn't happening. Yet they still went ahead with it, even though there was so many people that had had. It, what we're all we're doing now is revealing that yeah all right you have got people saying no we still don't give a shit <laughs> we yeah. can do it if we're revealing them that they're not a democracy we're just Be proving that they're not a democracy but when I mean we know that I mean the fact is that I think what a lot of the movements need to understand and what the movement in general needs to understand is that we know that they're not a democracy we have I mean with Snowden, with WikiLeaks, and etc., starting all of this off realistically back back when they back when they started, and they, I mean, the way they hounded down these these poor people just for telling the truth, mm -hmm. automatically showed the first signs of what these governments are about. And what we've realised is that we are no better than how we first started when democracy was an idea. We're in the exact same place because we have done, we have gone full circle. Our families and our parents before us have fought for democracy. And now we have lost every single right like we had. We have it for the moment because for them it's obviously good to have it. You know, because I but mean, do, do, show not, them that do you think you've studied history in that? And do you not think if looking in the future, if there's anything there for future historians are looking back, will they not see us as callous and barbaric? As, as You know, like when they do about the Romans, they go on about how gluttonous they were and they'd have these... The, big banquets and they'd gorge themselves and they'd, you know, like they found mass graves of babies and, and things that we all would think is barbaric. But do you not think that as a society we are just as barbaric? The, the wars, the, the birth defects, the, the, the things like that, you know, that we're not civil, we, we like to think that we've moved on and become more civilised, but we are no more civilised. We're as selfish and as deadly as ever. Mm. No, yeah. I, I, would, I would agree with you. The only thing is that we treat our own. The difference is, I would say, and this is probably what we took what we took from Rome. I mean, the Romans, for example, were very similar to, um, say, Britain and the West, in the sense that if you are Roman, you were above human. The Roman citizen had rights. They had an they had a standing. So if you were Roman, you were seen as you had certain rights. You had rights before the court. You had a court. You had you you were innocent till proven guilty, but if you were not Roman, God forbid you were, you had nothing. So and it's that's a supreme. Do a supreme. I mean, that's exactly the same as we are at the moment, although we're losing that status as well. What we're doing, I mean, if you think of Britain, for example, yes, Britain is quite nice to its own citizens. You know, as long as you follow the law, you follow what you're supposed to do, get a debt, get a house, send your kids to school to be brain, you know, all that kind of stuff, you're fine. Yeah. But if you're, for example, in an oil-rich country somewhere in the Middle East, God help you. Seriously, mm. God help you. Yeah. And I think that's where we are. But we are at that stage where they have taken control and done whatever they want in most of the countries in the world. The only thing they have now got to sort out is their own population because we're starting to become too unruly. And this yeah. happened also in Rome. When the workers in Rome walked out, they got massacred. They were, they were lines of crosses, and obviously I'm talking about the, um, the uh, revolt of the gladiator afterwards as well, which ended up with mass light. And if you, and if you don't know the size of Italy, it's quite big. Yeah. All the road from Rome to Naples was littered in crosses. From Rome to Naples was littered in crosses, people being crucified because they disagreed and because they didn't, they didn't like the standard we're, we're in. And most of those gladiators it's were... It's exactly the same, and uh, I think different means, seeing, but same method. Yeah, we're seeing it in, like you said, the, the other the other countries. We're seeing it quite blatantly, and I can't believe we're allowing it. Well, no, I can believe it's like you said in history. It's been going on and on and on. Um, I think that we we disassociate ourselves with um any kind of um 
you know similarity to them we, we struggle to place ourselves in their place when when you come on a higher conscience you kind of look and you go oh oh they're, they're four they're the same age as this child you, you can associate them in yourself you can mm. sort of go oh but i think this is what these people they struggle with empathy because I don't think they see it's real. It's almost like guns aren't real. That's only in America. Yeah, yeah. And it's that, I mean, the reason, yeah. You've got the problem with corporations is that, you know, um, I've heard lot from lots of sources and that it is actually law that profit be their, you know, the be all and end all, that a, a corporate entity must strive for profit above all else, you know, above impact to society. Mm -hmm. That is their number one job. So that's their mantra. Uh, yeah. So, mm -hmm. it, and then if you look back, I think it was the banana, the banana protest a long time ago. They they were trying to get cheaper bananas, so they went over and like occupied some like quite out African place that was, and then they um the workers wanted to work for more, so they um. They had a protest, and then they went over and slaughtered all of them. They they mur just murdered all the bananas. I mean, I I think it's thousands. That was a corporation. But I mean, these, that's... These, these are corporations that have now gone on, like Monsanto with their Agent Orange and things like that. They've gone on to be major companies now. That that you know, I think there's only like 20 companies that own things. You know, and this is their roots, their barbaric roots, and and I mean. Even now with the oil, they go over and just kill tribal people and shit. I mean, think of it, and again, it's, it's, what, it's what we said before, in the sense that if you are in Britain, if you occupy something, they have to abide by the law, be nice, etc. You know, Yes, they may water can you, water can you but they're not going to massacre you. If you're outside of the West, you have no rights. If you decide to occupy something, you're fighting for your life because they will just go in and kill you and replace you. And it just and shows to show how cowardly we've become because um, not that I believe in um, any kind of violence but I, I strongly believe if you start something you should follow it through mm. because um, all you're doing is reaffirming yeah, these people they can't do this if, if, I, if I plan on occupying something damn I'm occupying that and they're not going to move me and I will take it to the max to the point where I think well no I've said I'm going to occupy this this is what I set out to do am I not just falling to and you're not being violent you're physically re you are telling them you are re refusing to move yourself from this part of land this land that in my paradigm <laughs> belongs to the world and if I want to you know if I want to travel to somewhere like Palestine and then come back, or I want to try, or they want to travel to here. I really don't see any problem with, you know, you've got countries that are saying, stop letting these kids in. For God's sake, have a bit of compassion. Mm. Just a little bit, at least. Just, you know, have a bit of compassion because if it was up to me, I'd have a whole load of them. Yeah. <laughs> There's a little bit area in the corner there. <laughs> I know it's not comfortable, but, but you I'll see. Treat you well. I mean, the point is that, yes, we can't have everybody in Britain here. Obviously, immigration is, is yeah. like that. You can't just have everybody from the Middle East that's a refugee coming to a small island. That's not the point. The point is that we have wrecked those countries. It is not that they're bringing this violence upon themselves. Nice. The businesses nice. that work from the West go over there, wreck those countries, and put these people that are in there. Like, I mean, most of the people that are in power over in those those countries in the Middle East and Cyprus who have now been removed in the Arab Springs replaced by worse dictators they're all put in there by us by various other means I mean it's become out with WikiLeaks and various others that we have wrecked those countries Afghanistan and Iraq were thanks to Bush and Tony Blair and they have destroyed those countries so we have a duty of care to those people now because we have destroyed them we have destroyed their institutions that they have so now when we have a duty to take care of them when when do we make them accountable? You know, how many atrocities can a country do before somebody is going to, you know, they go on about Iraq and the reasons for going into Iraq or Afghanistan, but America has committed way worse crimes. Oh, God, they yeah. created way worse um, conditions and affected, mer I mean, how many people have been killed by drones? How many children have been killed by drones? When is somebody going to be brave enough to stand up. Well, it's never going to happen, is it? But 
I mean, let's be honest. I mean, if you look at the way countries are formed, most countries form by the unification of different tribes. You know, they start off in a small manner where there's one tribe in one area and then they sort of unify over, over a large period of time. That's how England was created. And then obviously we invaded Scotland and Wales and took them over as well and then expanded. America, on the other hand, which is effectively the world leader at the moment and the reason for the current paradigm or status quo, as it were, America was, wasn't formed by small tribes taking unifying. It was formed by a load of Westerners going over there, annihilating the indigenous peoples of that land. And when I say annihilate, because most Native Americans don't exist anymore, to the point where, I mean, there are a few left, but let's be honest, they are basically my great extinct. My, my great-grand, uh, Cheyenne Indian. Oh, really? That's fascinating. Yeah. So, I mean, um, there's, there's, there isn't many. I mean, and that is something that a lot of people don't know. If you ever, if you ever wanted to have something quite funny to read, if you're ever bored enough, pick up a history textbook in an American high school. The amount of rubbish that is, it's, it's like fiction. They believe, and they genuinely believe this, that in Thanksgiving what happened was that the white settlers pacified and joined hands with the Native Americans in a cold winter to bring in the harvest. What actually happened, if you look at you know, European history yeah. books on this topic and academic papers, is that the white settlers were dying and the Native Americans gave them food to survive the winter because they didn't know how to grow crops in their new land. What happened afterwards is that the white settlers decided, okay, these people have food. The next day they slaughtered them all and stole all their food so their children started starving. Which is, I mean, that's the kind of mentality those people had to the point but where the Native Americans... Up. Huh? Yeah. It still goes on. I mean, in um, yeah, the Aboriginal yeah, I mean, why would it change? Natives, you know, the way that they, they were supplied alcohol and they were given, you know, given these social issues to contend with, as well as the distortions of their homes and lands, and their children taken off them to be indoctrined into our way of life. It, it's and it still goes on, and it's barbaric. But I mean, why would it change? And think about it this way: that country's ethos is like that. But the thing is, if you it is. Mm. Yeah, but when you think of it, um, when we're talking about how awake people are, you think when people first come to the movement, um, at the, say at this stage I'm at now, I, I can sit there and say, right, well that must be false because I do not believe in in what 9/11 has been represented as. That must be false. Um, this must be false because of the indigenous people. Are, you know, this, that, that, that's got to be false. Um, these people are being um, taught at schools by this brainwork by this government, and then we're expecting them straight away to understand that everything they've learned is shit, <laughs> just shit. And then we then we expect them to just go, okay. That's all right. There's going to be that moment you're going to have anger, denial, um, panic, paranoia, suicides, um, uh, y doubt. You're going to have everything ranging before you get to that stage where you are in that paradigm where you're like, okay, so this is how it is. That's how it's happened. This is what we, we need to try and do. And let's try and do this. But you've got to allow these people to go through those these these moments to um, to fully take in what they're taking in. They're taking in everything that they're taking in um, everything they've known to be a lie. So when you've got these people that are just suddenly waking up and realizing, when people are saying, "Why aren't people um, waking up and moving?" They are, and that is why now we've got. Um, FEMA camp set up while we've got um, the government ready to bring out water cannons. They know we're waking up. They know it is working, whether we like to believe it or not. We're out. We've got people online going, this isn't working. Uh, what's happening? It is fucking working. Otherwise, they wouldn't be getting the water cannon out. They wouldn't be getting this kind of thing out. So what they're trying to do is promote a, an uneasy kind of, if you do this, we're going to trash you. That's just not going to happen. If we stay peaceful, we stay bang on what we're doing, we stay totally, um, you know, focused on how we want things and what we're going to do, non-compliant, self-sustainable, mm. they, they, they can't do anything unless they want to do exactly what they're doing in places like Syria mm -hmm. and Palestine, wrap us up and kill us off. At that point, it's too late anyway.
Yeah. I mean, I see the water cannon as actually a positive thing, surprisingly enough. Um, the reason why I see it as a positive thing is not because I, I have any reason to like, like being water cannon in the face, but the fact is that when things like that happen, it's like you've said, it's Strange positive. Myth. It is now becoming, it's now, it's now becoming desperate for them. In a sense, if you look at, for example, the way India became independent, they first gathered people. The British tried to ignore it. It didn't work. They started to punch them. They started to beat. They started to shoot them, but they kept peacefully marching around India. And then what happened? Once they got to the point where they just kept beating mm -hmm. people up to the point where you, they're all bloody and dying, but nothing's happening. You can't force anybody to do something. You can kill them, but you can't force them to do something they want. And frankly, what working class people need to realize, and what everybody needs to realize, is that they need us as much. They need us. We don't need them. They need us to keep this society alive. They need us to keep this society the way exactly, it is. Yeah, yeah. So you society have to understand it's just it. an idea. Exactly, it's just an idea, and their idea requires a lot of people at the bottom end. Yeah. And if these people at the bottom end suddenly decide, okay, we're not going to do what you want shall unless I, shall you pay I move us. Should I move on to my one quickly? Yeah, let's go for it. I didn't actually know how time it was. Yeah, let's go for it. Sorry. No, it's all right. I said it about two seconds ago. That's why I was like, <laughs> <laughs> it's the uh, lag, I think. Um, but yeah, are you sure? Do you want to? <laughs> huh? No, no. Let's go. Let's go ahead. Let's Did go. Do you want to finish that? Huh? <laughs> no, I was just gonna say no. It's just um. Sure. Okay. All right. <laughs> 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 Go on, Mario. Finish what you were saying. <laughs> Uh, no, no, no I, was, I, was, I, was, I was at the end point. I was just, I was just going to say that it, I, think, I think it is just a point where it is a positive thing that things are getting violent on their end because it just means that they're getting worried. Mm. Simple as that. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I think they're very worried. Okay. Yeah, because yeah, they know yeah. more people yeah. are going to get... Um, I think a lot of people are going to lose their homes and a lot of people are going to lose their jobs those people have become more desperate and they'll want to stand, you know, they've worked hard all their life, they're going to want to make a stand. It's yeah. like they say, you can't... The ones, they're using the ones that are just waking up by yeah. instilling this in them. Because the ones that are, are higher, they're thinking, right, we know this isn't going to work, we know what their plan is, that what they're doing is taking the ones that haven't yet got to the point where they understand exactly what's going on and they're and they're going to feel this, and they know that if they can cause a civil unrest, they they've won. They know. Uh, it. Yeah, yeah. But let's go on to your one. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, my one is um, bullying in um, in social activism networking kind of media sort of thing. Of uh, newbies, yeah. So they're sort of, um, yeah. A new a new person's coming along. I'll just take take a you know a small example. A new person comes along. They've um, they've read about the NHS cuts. They've read about the firefighters being um, taken up. They've read about all these things. They haven't quite got onto the fact of of information such as 9/11 false flags. Um, Palestine, uh, the apartheid, you know, they haven't got onto the issues that we've quite reached on. So they're not totally 100% that when you post things um, out with the ISIS and stuff, that it could be propaganda, that when they when they join places like Britain first, that it's, it's propaganda. Um, and I think that we need, we, we're now into a point where I know I've had numerous messages turning around and saying to me, I'm struggling to find my place in this movement. And the only reason I'm hearing things like that is because I think that we need to be more welcoming and we need to understand that people have different views, they have diverse views. And if anything, a difference of opinion is beneficial because diversity opens the door to debate. Debate's healthy and it gets, things, uh, it gets more perspective of how we put things together. And so you've got these new people joining and they're going, okay, I'm going to post this. Then you've got somebody turn around and go, well, that's not going to help. Why are you bothering doing that? That's just a waste of time. Fucking, I'm sick of these keyboard warriors. You've instantly knocked that person, a person's confidence in the movement. You've made them more afraid of having their own opinion. You've made them feel very uncomfortable 
in the place they're at and I would most likely at that point back off and think yeah I'm, I'm not I'm not comfortable with this so you're you're screaming out to the world awake the masses and you're frightening them away and then on the other hand you're also putting on your wall love peace and unity but I know a lot of people that have on their wall love peace and unity yeah I've seen them three seconds later post into somebody's comment box stop being a fucktard you you need to wake up um, that ain't language that's not language that you need to use for people that just need a little bit of guidance possibly a bit of advice a little way we should offer them the path we should say right this is what's happening and then let them branch out whatever way they want to go what, but that's it, we're, where... we're almost like saying if you don't follow the path and go this way then we're going to shoot you down and make you feel like shit and, and we're wanting them to to come into a love, peace, unity kind of let's take down this government, let's work together, let's be be as one, and then bullying. It is bullying. I think that's where yeah. we've done quite well is that we've had um, quite a few uh, new new protesters come through Wave, and they they felt quite secure being in a friendly group. That's you know we'll answer questions. We'll we wouldn't ridicule somebody for saying something that was maybe. Maybe something that was maybe mainstream thinking and not protest or activist way of thinking. You know, we'd rather reach out to people and engage with them and encourage them to take a step with us than put them off by putting them on the spot and belittling them. Because I've, you know, there's been things that I've read. And I've looked at it and I thought, well, that's a load of bollocks, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then a few weeks later, it's like, oh shit, that was right. that was right. You know, we've all done it. You know, we could, we shouldn't point the finger out and belittle people for doing it. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I, I completely agree with you. I, it, and it, I mean, it is bullying. It is it is a form of bullying. You know, the fact that we just assume we just assume bullying is only re only reduced for those for those times in school and all that. It's it's not it's not it's not just reserved for that. It's reserved for any time when you just. You attack somebody just because of a different opinion, and just because you may know more information than the next person. The fact that they've gone there and searched out and looked for somebody that may have, maybe more enlightened at that point than they are, clearly shows that your message is working. Then you're going to kick them back by being aggressive towards them. That makes no sense. It's almost like you're fighting your own your yeah. own mission. And then we then we have to look at how, then we have to look at how um, pages like Britain First and Revolution Britain and that were actually created in the first place. Have we have we ever thought that possibly we created them by not giving that, um, by making people away so they've had to learn their own information? And then you've got this propaganda coming through on the mainstream, um, for, for instance, like Muslims. You've got propaganda, propaganda against Muslims. Um, quite obviously in this country and on the um, media so you, you're, you're being handed this media you're not knowing which newspaper to trust you've not known because we've refused guidance because that first person they met in the movement to wake them up has turned around and done this and they are seeing that we are also saying that in Palestine this is happening and that this is happening um, and they've got very mixed up information and it is very 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 difficult as a newcomer to, to um, tear apart the truth. I think you have to be in this game a long time before you realise which one, which are insurgents, which one's propaganda, what papers to trust, what what walls to trust, and who has their own agendas. Um, but that's and, another issue on its own, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. The, so you've the, got the, the, the whole like, oh, he's copper, he's yeah. copper, he's copper, but no proof being offered. You know, you can't just go around pointing fingers at people. No. I mean, we got called coppers at one point, didn't we, <laughs> on Wave 2? <Yeah>, MI5. <laughs> and it's like, you know, if you're going to make these accusations, I'm all ears, but back it up with a bit of evidence. <laughs> prove, prove it to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's, that's the point. I mean, it, uh, you know, there's a lot of accusations going around, and we're, we're always talking about evidence. But when you make such a... And it is paranoia. But I mean, the whole point of the movement, and it's not going to go anywhere if we just keep we just keep to ourselves and not 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 expand on anything. Because the whole point is that our movement is only successful if it has a huge number of people. Let's be honest, yeah. we can't make any sort of you know wave or any sort of change with with a few of with a few core people. It's never going to happen. 
You you need no. that huge number and you need it to go viral and the only way that's going to happen is if you become inclusive. Well, if you sit back and look at things in terms of, you, you take that moment to sit back and look at things. Like I was sitting in the car today and thinking about, I was like this traffic jam and we're going all the way down and there's people trying to get out of the station and there's people going out in the roundabout and I'm sitting there thinking, as a courteous thing, we should go share, 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 share. Right, people would flow. But what you've got is you've got some arrogant little pums out there, right? <laughs> and I'm driving along and the first two in front of me are like, they speed up so they can close the gap as quick as they can because they're desperate. They cannot let that person out. But no reason, they can't. And maybe that's how society has learned to be. My first thing was like, well, I'm going to let them out and then I'm going to go. And then I noticed the person behind me let the next one out. And then we got to the roundabout, we had that same issue again. People not letting people through. And I think that's what we're having. We're having people that are so stuck on what they're doing and what they're, they're we're getting traffic jams and build-ups of people that can't quite make any headway because they're hitting, they're, they're not being let in. They're not mm. being allowed in. It's not fair. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I completely agree with you. I think it is about, it, it's the way, but, but I mean, I think humans can be, can be, and for lack of a better word, molded almost into certain mm -hmm. things, and we can be molded and unmolded into different ways, and like people can be molded to be nice, people can also be molded to be aggressive and nasty, and I mean, in our, in our schooling system, think, think about, you know, the primary school and so forth, we're always told to be aggressive, we're told to be competitive, we're told to screw the next man, if you can get it, get it. That's the nature yeah, of yeah. capitalism, that's just the way things are. And although it may seem irrelevant because that is school and that's just driving down a road, but it goes down to everything you do in life. If you're told to be competitive, be always first, win, 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 no matter what the consequences are, you're going to put it to everything you are in life. If, for example, there is a dessert at a cafeteria and there's somebody starving next to you, you're going to take that dessert because you want to win. You want to be the first person to have it. The revival of the fittest. <laughs> exactly. And, and the, the, the problem is, all right, you've got the circle of life. You do have survival of the fittest, but um, we're not animals like that. And Anymore. we were never... No, no. And I know I understand it's survival of the fittest, but in this day and age in humanity, there is no need for survival of the fittest. Yeah, you've got people at the sports day gives competition, competition. All competition creates is a divide instantly. What is wrong with saying, all right, competition may not be as healthy as we actually thought it is. Maybe working together is a better way forward. <laughs> But that, you know, that's not what the um, system wants to. That's no, not no. what the system wants to uphold at the moment. No, not at all. I mean, it thrives on this competition, and that's what capitalism. That's what has I mean, if you think about businesses, that's how they operate. They operate in competition. The best business wins and becomes the biggest one, makes the most money. That's just how the world works in this system that we live in at the moment, and it just trickles down to the rest of society. I mean, what's the what's wrong with young people learning how to cooperate in, for example, classrooms and so forth, so they make the best possible answer? as opposed to them all working individually, some failing, some succeeding. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, which one's clearly better? Yeah. We, we totally, um, we're totally in a civilization where we, we decide that the, the best ones that excel are the ones with a better life. And it shouldn't always be that way. Sometimes I, I believe that the labor, the most laborious um, should be achieving the, the more sort of benefits, not somebody in a suit that's decided that he can own six or seven people so he's now going to get a massive extensive pay rise. No, if, you, you're, if you're working and slaving from seven till seven in the day, you want a better wage. If you're going in a building and rescuing people who are um, out of fires and things, you want a better wage. It should never be about how much you own, it should be about how much you put into society and how, how much you work hard at that. But then, if you look at like celebrity, you took and down and put in your journey there. You look at like celebrity and, and rich, famous people. These people get shit sent them for free. They don't even have to buy the stuff anymore. <laughs> you know, yeah. they get all this money, and then everyone gives them everything for free. Yeah, it's I mean, that's a massive irony. That is the fact yeah. is that when you're going through life, 
you go through life and you need to pay for everything. But once you become famous, everything becomes free, and that's when you have the most amount of money. Yeah. yeah. You know, and it, again, it's the capitalist mentality because celebrities wearing your clothes mean that your clothes suddenly become the best seller of the best seller of that month because of the pool they have, because of the way TV makes them, makes us want to idolize them. I mean, there are some celebrities that should not be famous. I mean, most of them should not be famous. Nobody should have that much time dedicated to oneself. It's just ridiculous. But again, it's the way society works is that they you know, need. It's almost, like, it's almost like companies need a human face. Because they're so corporate, they need a human face to identify with the clothes, with the perfume, yeah. with whatever. And celebrities give that human face. Because as soon as, for example, I don't know, as soon as Kim Kardashian, for example, wears something, every single person will know about that clothing. Apart from the, I, the few that don't connect with, um, with, with, that, with that celebrity culture, which is frankly a very, very minute, minute amount. I think the activist world doesn't. The, the, somebody was on there the other day on on in the mirror, and they're like, "Oh, look at his hair! What a shock!" And I'm like, "Who the fuck is that?" <laughs> he's, like, he's like an A-list footballer. <laughs> but you see, I have no idea, and I'm, I mean, I'm proud to say that the only celebrity that I actually know is Kim Kardashian, and that's because I like to use her as an example for everything. Yeah. I think, well, I think we she epitomizes. As well, huh? didn't we? We hear about Justin Bieber wearing an anonymous mask, or and um, that's how they enter our world in a different. What Did they've he? done wrong? Yeah. I think that's insulting, frankly. Yeah. <laughs> that's just insulting. I mean, it's like it's like wearing a it's like burning the cross or burning the Quran. You know, it's somebody's it's a, some something that somebody believes in. That's the idol of something that somebody believes in, and they're if you're using it yeah. as a prop. You wouldn't have a massive cross yeah. behind your concert, so why would you have that? Uh, that's a yeah, mess. and the, he gets slandered by the public, or so not the public, the uh, press, wasn't it? I can't remember what the um. He got slandered, the, did it? I can't remember what happened. What happened, Pay, with it? I don't isn't, know. He, isn't he in jail now? I don't know. <laughs> I, I know they didn't want him in. He was Canadian, and they were trying to get him deported from America. And they had that big petition. I know when they had Cup Bieber on um, Twitter. He he just got caught smoking a joint, and I thought Cut the Bieber was a charity gig where we all had to send a spliff to Bieber. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realise it was teenage girls cutting themselves. It's it's crazy. <laughs> I it's, like, it's, he's got enough right, fucking money, not, time to buy his own. <laughs> yeah, the society is so far fetched. It's unbelievable. The only time I see Justin Bieber is like he does things like that. He's got the Anon mask on and then the other one was um, you've got the video on YouTube where he's got the flicky eyes and it's like Justin Bieber's a lizard and um, that, that's the only time I kind of see snippets of these celebrities. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I don't... Uh, I mean, I, I think celebrities are the epitome of what's wrong in society in the sense that you want, you want a grouping to sort of blame and to sort of look at, I think they're the epitome of what's wrong. Because they're the ones that are there doing something stupid as soon as water cannons get published in London, for example. They're the ones that will do something outrageous as soon as the governments do something to remove our rights. They're, they're almost like the clowns of capitalism in the sense that they amuse you while the government is doing something wrong. Yeah. And they're being used as much as we are, but I think they're getting, they're probably getting a slightly better cut because at least they get yeah. to live a, live a better well, life. Think, but I think, when when, get, I, I think we're actually, I think a lot of celebrities don't get what you think. You know, when yeah. you go and revisit celebrities that we maybe knew from 10 years ago, they haven't necessarily got well, a great lifestyle. I think a lot of them celebrity is illusion. You know, they don't all meet up and have these big parties together. They just live normal lives in normal houses. Some of them make phenomenal amounts of money, you know, where you're talking like worldwide stars. But your average, person, yeah, your average person on like Coronation Street. In fact, my kids go to school with um, Joe Joyner's kids who was in EastEnders. She was married to Max, I can't remember her name. She had breast cancer, I don't know. So, you know, she just lived in a normal house. She's been on telly, she's done a bit of acting, but day to day you wouldn't peg her any different to us. But we tend to have this illusion that she have some great lifestyle. But I mean, I wouldn't actually think of um, those kind of celebrities. When I think of celebrities, if I'm totally honest, I think of um, the yeah. big stars. 
you know, the ones yeah. that are always yeah. plastered all over adverse, the ones that are yeah. always on TV doing something stupid. I mean, the Miley Cyrus is of this world, for instance. Yeah. Or like you said, the Justin yeah. Bieber's, or the Kim Kardashian's of this world. Those kind of people are the issue of society. Because let's be honest, who follow? I mean, seriously, who reads about people in Coronation Street, apart from the diehard fans in that select community? The people that those are the worldwide celebrities, the ones that are always shoved down in your face continuously. Yeah, yeah. And I think those are the ones that are, are in a form in, connected to the reason why people are so dis detached from it. Because they're, as I said, you know, they're the ones that are making you amused while the government removes one of your um, one of your rights. I would, you know, a lot of celebrities, like maybe not so now, now where we've got like the YouTube celebrities. I do think Justin Bieber started on YouTube, didn't really. he? And um, I don't know. I just remember my son saying because we've got YouTube to thank for him because <laughs> my son don't like him or something. And, oh, um, nice. But you got um, like a lot of celebrities are, are quite damaged people. Mm. Like emotionally, they have they crave this need for admiration and desire and worship. You know that they, they some of them have been abused and that's why they crazy that thing, you know, but some of them, they, they, they're so insecure that they can be so easily manipulated into well, taking Russell whatever Brand stand. He, he went into his plight on getting, he wanted to be a celebrity, he wanted to know, he wanted to be, he wanted it all, he wanted everything, and then he realised when he got to it, it actually doesn't change it, people still hate you, just now a different type of people hate you. Mm. Hmm. I mean, uh, I mean, yeah, go on. I was just going to say, well, I know they get rewarded for, for what they're doing, but I, I think a lot of them are quite damaged people. Mm. Again, I mean, I think they are the epitome of what this system is. Mm. You know, this system abuses people that are at the bottom of society, it brings them up and then destroys them. In the sense that afterwards, there is nothing left but an empty shell of a human being because you get hounded by the press. You get your own specific you know, paparazzi journalist that hounds you continuously, hounds your family, if you ever got to have kids and so forth, you have all these issues with them as well, because they get hounded by the press. It's a life that you're, it's almost like you're, you're, you're cursing yourself by taking all this money, but you're going to have to pay for it eventually. Nothing, nothing comes free in the world of capitalism, and if you have this much privacy. amount of money... With celebrities, it's a lot of the time, it's your privacy, isn't it, that you, you're paying with. That's but it. I mean, I don't think we should. I don't personally. I don't. I don't feel sorry for them that much because I mean, if you want the fame and fortune, you can't think that it's going to come free of charge. Society, the society that you live in, this uh, very very aggressive society that you live in, will want something in return, and often in their case, it's their sanity. They uh, want and the freedom they, drive their sanity. They build people up and they knock them down in the most horrendous ways sometimes. Yeah, you know, you've, got, you've got to be quite hard nosed, I think. But I think some some of it is kind of a pacifier for society. I mean, when I grew up in a children's home, and life wasn't always great, and I lived in a fairy tale world in my head, and I'd see these stories of um, celebrities that have grew up in care and gone on to do things, or, or you know, you hear sad stories and things, and you kind of think. Well, maybe that's the purpose. I'm going to, you know, do you know what I mean? It's, it's kind of for children. Maybe it, it kind of, it's it, another form of control. Is pacification of if something goes wrong, and and you manage to make lots of money and be famous, then it's it's all worthwhile. It's like a, it's a it's a lesson that you have to learn to get there. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I understand. I mean, it's uh, sorry to mention history again, but it's the same reason that religion, organized religion, was was invented in a way. I mean, if you think about it, if people in Africa, for example, and Africa is a very, very religious continent, if half of those people realized or understood that actually it's not like that, religion isn't like the way they thought, I'm pretty sure there'd be mass suicides tomorrow because the conditions that they live are are unhuman. Seriously, I mean, they work for a dollar a day, sometimes not even that. And they do it because in their eyes, okay, I take shit now, but once I die, I get to live a great life in heaven. If they didn't have that assurance, people wouldn't stand for the stuff they stand for. 
and celebrities are almost like an evolution of that in the capitalist sense, like you've said. People wouldn't take this kind of rubbish if they knew that there wasn't a chance that you could that you could evolve and become rich. I mean, the, I, uh, I remember hearing that there's now a um, mathematical conclusion that capitalism actually doesn't make wealth in the sense that if you are born poor, you're going to die poor. Only a small amount change. And the majority of yeah. them, the, the people that are rich now, I mean, if you think of the well-known entrepreneurs, like the Russell, the um, not Russell, Brent, the um, uh, Virgin guy, what's his name? Richard, Richard Branson. Branson and, of course, the guy that invented Facebook and so forth, of this world, the entrepreneurs, most of them, only managed to do that because they had a very, very wealthy family that backed them to do what they did. So in actual fact, it's just a passing on of the wealth. Because, I mean, we're forgetting that Mark Zuckerberg was in Yale University. Yeah. That's not cheap. His parent family paid no. for his way. He didn't have to take any job, so he could dedicate his whole time on creating a new idea. Yeah. Most working class people have to work for most of their life. You don't have time to think as much as, you, as much as other people. And on top of that, if you have a great idea, good luck trying to get help because you need finance, you need money to make money. If you don't have it in the first place, how can you possibly make well, it? Now turn that into a joke with things like Dragon's Den. It's like a joke. Oh, let's see if you can come up with anything worthwhile, and we'll make a barter with you. But we're going to take as much of it as we can. So they've they've normalised corporatocracy. Yeah. Uh, well, it's BBC advertising. Normalised. But that, that, uh, the, pre the BBC is blatantly advertising with the Dragon's Den because all of those items that go in there become bestsellers. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So they've got prime aired airtime yeah. and they basically create the next craze. That's fucking advertising. Mm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah, it's, 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 it's kind of like, it's like X Factor though. I can't watch it like that. It feels like watching kittens being drowned. It's like, oh, fucking hell. Really? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's these, people's, it's these people's hopes and dreams. And it's almost, it's yeah. almost like, it's almost like these people's hopes and dreams, the 99% hopes and dreams, getting drowned repeatedly and laughed at by the 1%. It's again, sorry to bring in history again, but it's like back in the day when lords used to bring in poor people to laugh at and just ask them about random things about English and so forth because they knew they weren't educated. They would just laugh at the way they speak. It's the same, think, same kind of humiliation. But what makes it worse is the people by their droves lap this shit up. They like to watch people be built up and knocked down and that is you know, where we are could find more unity with our fellow man rather than with, this country loves nothing more than building somebody up into a onto a pedestal and kicking the fucking away. They really... And that's you know, not just the 1%. Car crash TV. Mm. Yeah, and that's, that's not just the 1%. And um, we've got to a point where people are enjoying the demise of others because it makes them feel better about themselves. Because their lives aren't going the way they planned either. No. No. What, they, what we view as it feels like they're drowning kittens, they're seeing it as comedy. They're like, yeah. oh, look at that. You because know, they're like, forgetting like, oh, that the amount of damage that does to yourself. They're forgetting the amount of hurt that that actually would create if you were in that situation. Yeah. Mm. And I think what, what it's easier to do, it is easier to laugh at that and think, okay, my laugh's not that bad because at least I'm not him or at least I'm not her. Reality exactly. is that... in such small little indiscrepancies, it discre like little things like, well, that would never happen to me because I've, um, I've got a job. To me, that's a discrepancy. That's nothing in the world of humanity. Ooh, you've got a job. Wow, that makes you so much better Definitely. than me. Is you know, uh -huh. got a job this week. <laughs> Next yeah, exactly. week you haven't. <laughs> the thing is, it depends because then you've also got the other side of humanity that goes, well, you weren't very good, so ha ha, you deserved it. No one deserves it. No one actually deserves to feel all right. They do deserve thing. I think the word deserve is chucked round, you know, when you've got someone like um that that woman off of Benefit Street, White D. When um you've got she's getting death threats, she's getting this, she's getting that. Does she actually deserve it? Because that is what society turned her into. That is what society brought to her doorstep. She's got it shows you that when I watched Benefit Street, I spent most of it feeling sad, feeling upset when that, that family from um, Poland, I think it was, or whatever, and they yeah, had no but, electric. Yeah. 
and he again he was worried about his life and stuff like that and I felt so bad and then I was like god this is gonna this is gonna be amazing when this comes out people are gonna feel and then I forgot that we're we're a very unempathetic and discompassionate oh come country. on we voted for you I, like, I think that says it all yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we have to know. learn to be more empathetic towards fellow men. I think. No, we do. We do. And I mean, what's sad, what's really, really sad about Benefit Street is that apparently a lot of the footage that they shot, they didn't, they showed it specifically to make it in the worst possible manner available. Yeah. They they and, I mean, I thought. So, I mean, I remember seeing seeing. Only some show. I didn't. I didn't watch a lot of it because I tried to watch as little amount of TV as I possibly can because it's got a lot of it. So much crap. But um, I followed it all. <laughs> I mean, what I saw was a load of people getting pushed to the edge because of the society they live in, and it's even in the micro sense because the place that they live in, there are no jobs to fit into a society like a normal person, like the way the way the government expects. They are pushed to the edge, mm. and I remember seeing that guy. The um, I think it was a 50p man who drove around, at least he was trying to fit into capitalism, he was trying to, despite the guy, it's almost like this 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 guy was sort of saying, you know, I can be capitalist too, I, I can do it, you know, I, I can be involved, it's not that hard, struggling to be able yeah. to start his own business, and it also was always like, you know, and the capitalists over there laughing at him saying, oh, look at him trying, you know, you're a joke. Yeah, and that's the way they saw we it. don't actually view I yeah, we. Whereas I, when I watched it, I, I, I think I took out all the um, good bits because I have to admit, when I first watched it, I actually thought this can't be that bad because I felt really sorry for that Polish family. I felt like, you know, next day in the papers, tell them to fucking go home. It's like, oh. So I think it's also how we've been trained to perceive it because I did mm. not perceive it the way they perceived it. I felt so sorry for that couple, that young couple. Um, where I, he was sent out on a job where he was never rewarded for it. He, he wasn't going to get paid for that and I, I was ultimately deeply upset for that, that couple at that point. Yeah, I mean we forget I how... With, I think with them like some activists, especially like right wing activists, extremists, um, they you know will diss white deal and, and go on about the benefit system but I think you have to like some, for some people, it is a choice not to be a slave. Mm. You know, we might not agree with it, and we might think, well, we're all entitled to it. But for some people, it is a political statement. And really, as a society, if we do not have that safety net, then we might as well just call ourselves slaves. If there is mm. no choice not to work, yeah. you are a slave. If you have to work, Very you true. are a slave. And you might as well just call us slaves. You know, I'm, I, I. I, you know, I don't really like it when somebody's ten years on benefits, and you know, you. I I tried when my husband lost his job, and, and we got refused any benefit. You know, we got four kids, um, we had to live a year without any income. You know, I get pissed off with the way the system is, but I admire someone who stands up and says, "Fuck you! I'm not, I'm not working. I'm not buying into this. I'm just doing what I want." Their life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Really, you know, it's, it, the benefit bill is not as big as the bloody tax uh, gap, is it? No, not at all. I mean, you know, it's um, yeah, it's uh, it's, yeah. Is a hard, when you look back, is it was it medieval times? What was that? What was the hourly? What was the hourly um, working times and in, stuff? In medieval times, I think you worked 14 weeks of the year. We are worse off than medieval workers, right? And then in the 1940s, they looked at things with one man working, and um, they thought within 10 years that one man would be working half the time for the same amount of money. But somewhere along the line, capitalism was taken over, and rather than reduce man's working hour, it's increased it as much as possible because we yeah, have so much of working less. Yeah, the amount of jobs that could be automated nowadays. Yeah, I mean, we could, we could do, we could be. I mean, don't forget, money is not something real. It's something that we've invented. Yeah. So we could actually yeah. pay someone thirty pound an hour 
for doing any job. Therefore, they would live better. Everybody would get a job because they would work two days a week. Someone else would work two days a week. Someone else would work two days a week for that yeah. same job. And that is it. And, and everybody would get a job because there's a lot more humans on this earth. So we need we need to be able to find a way of giving people more jobs if we wanted to remain in this capitalist system. Yeah. And don't forget that also um, in medieval times, Friday was also a sacred holiday. So we had three days of holiday as opposed to two each week. Although now it's go down to one because Saturday is now a working yeah. day for most people nowadays. Yeah. So yeah. we're actually becoming even more, we're working more and more yeah. and more. Yeah. We're not evolving, we're devolving. We're going yeah. backwards, you know. Evolving and, and electronically, but who cares about that? We, you know, we've, we've forgotten the power of yeah. working. You don't know right. when you're going in the wrong we, direction. Every time we've got change, like working change, where we've got ended the workhouses or anything like that, it has been because fellow man has stood together and fought and said no. And that's what we need to get back to. Enough, you know, we, we were talking the other week, weren't we? We were saying that unions weren't really working. Mm. You know, so, so how can we, you know, what can we do to unite everybody? Again, because that is how you're going to get the, the fair working things. But it's going to take everybody, not just one or two. Everybody involved, and people. Yeah, because it can't be just one nice. person. They need to be nicer to people, and people might come a bit more. Well, we were talking about how um, maybe unions, because um, they are for working people. Straight away, they are cutting out a high um, proportion of society that aren't working and are poor. And then there's those that are working and can't afford the memberships. And we were saying that maybe unions should be free on their memberships. I mean, I don't think unions should be free on their memberships because, as we said again, unions could use that money to save up for a rainy day and create a bank for strikes, for instance. Yeah, but then we evolved on to, well, maybe they should be free for the members, but there is a tax like you've got or for the employer to pay, which funds the yeah. union. I mean, yeah, but employers, employers are rich, so... Yeah. So that way, because when you've got like a vote for a strike now, say like only 50% of your members vote, you could have 70% of your work, uh, workforce not even on uh, as union members. Mm. So the actual proportion supporting you is quite small. Whereas if it was free for all, maybe people would take a bit more of an interest. I mean, I think what yeah. should happen is I think the government should take slightly more care of the unions in the sense that they should force employers to first recognize unions because I know of some employees that don't actually have unions because the unions aren't recognized. The unions shouldn't have to fight for their own. The government, because the government is of the people, therefore the unions yeah. are of the people, therefore they should be working together. But then we're back to that whole problem that governments aren't governments anymore, they're corporation owned. They've but got you no see, power. You see, I mean, if, for example, again, it, it's, I mean, y yes, we believe, you know, that the governments don't have a lot of power because corporations are the ones that pay for their, for their wages, for their, um, for their, what's it called, for their manifestos and so forth, but they lie to us, so why couldn't they play their own game? And, for example, nothing stopping a government from getting elected on corporate money and then turning their backs on the corporations, giving power to the unions, taking the corporations to account, demanding them pay tax, because they've got four years to do it in. It's not like the corporation can then remove them because once they're democratically elected, that's it. Then it's down to then it's down to the government. So yes, the corporations may decide, okay, fine, we're going to cut all of your funding next election. Okay, we've got four years to fix this. And by the way, we could then also get money from the unions if we gave the unions power to take money from the people from the corporations. Therefore, the money would then come from the unions. So the, the parties would still have power. I think it's a matter of would any party take that risk. Yeah, because I mean, you've Probably got four not. years afterwards to sort things out. Even if the parties, even if the corporations suddenly decided to not fund you anymore, you've still but got four years is, in power. But that funding, um, I think you're thinking, right? Well, if say like Labour got in and Labour said, right, we're not having this anymore, shouted out all that was going wrong, named the corporations, blah blah blah, took a stance. The people would respect them that much more and vote for them that much more because they were putting their country first and the citizens first. They wouldn't need half the budgets that they need to promote themselves mm. because they'd already have won the people on a mass yeah. scale. 
Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. a lot of their funding goes on advertisement and um, and putting out and selling themselves, doesn't it? So if they haven't got to sell themselves so much, if they've already got to that stage, then surely a lot of the funding anyway would decrease. You Have you seen the, um, the Labour thing for the NHS? It's like, what number NHS baby are you? It's just like a massive data mining scam. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't actually like that your time of birth or even your second name or where you were born. It's just like your name. It gives you like a random number. I reckon they just make it up. Wow. But the details you do put in, because apparently you need your email to find out what um, baby number you are on the NHS, you will get signed up to all the um, labour bump. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy, oh. isn't it? Anything? Well, people have been going mad for it because when you look at it, you think that you're actually going to find out what number um, baby you were born on the NHS. But in the small print, they do say it, the figure's just estimated. So the whole thing is just pointing. It's a marketing <laughs> scam, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well done, I mean, it's man. ridiculous. It's terrible, really. It is, but well it done. Is. It is it's a massive be. con. Yeah. yeah. But this is the, they, what they don't seem to be getting, Labour, is that this is what people are hating about the government. When they say that people are disinterested in politics, this is why people are disinterested, because of the snide games that you keep playing. And, you know, I want a parliament that it doesn't matter what side I'm on, whoever stands up and says the best idea for our fellow citizens, I will agree with. Not just because it's like the opposition going, oh no, that's a rubbish idea, poo 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 poo. When actually it was quite a good idea and would benefit lots of people. Why can't, yeah. you, you know, maybe party politics needs to go? I think it does. I mean, I think personally that all political parties, registered ones with an elected representative, should be funded by the state. And not not have all this rubbish about um, oh corporate funding this corporate funding that because think about it I mean if all these parties were invest were, were given money from the state you know so a budget each equal you would not be voting them by how big their budget is you'd be voting by them for their ideas mm. on top of mm. that I mean people would say oh well why should my tax money go to the conservatives I'm not conservative that's not the point it's the bigger picture you're funding democracy you're giving your taxes are going towards democracy because someone else your next door neighbor may have those views. And that next door neighbor is paying for your views as well as you're paying for theirs. So you're yeah, paying for yeah. democracy. So it's not about giving mm -hmm. giving state funding to political parties because you don't want your taxes to go there. It's about stopping the likes of huge businesses giving millions of pounds to conservatives. They can run huge advertising campaigns, blowing the Greens and other parties completely out of the water because they can't afford to match it. Yeah. That's where they're yeah. getting elected because these huge but these yeah. two parties have a huge amount of budget. Who was that man in America? He was quite poor. He didn't have much funding, but um, he was doing quite well in the polls. And then um, they, they often they did a bit of a smear campaign on him. But the mainstream no news just stopped reporting on him. Just stopped. It's like with the UKIP, basically. Same thing. I mean, not yeah. UKIP. Sorry, Greens, Greens, the Greens. Yeah. Stop reporting on them. Because if you don't give everybody an equal say, and all news should be impartial. Yeah. You know, if you're going to say something about... Because um, they do it, say, like with Palestine. You never see somebody go on and talk about the horrors of Palestine that isn't followed by an Israeli giving the opposing view. So when you're talking politics, why not take all the main runners, you know, not just the top three, in, which would include UKIP getting more airtime, but also Greens getting equal say, because to me it's just like they're pushing forward UKIP. They're building up a hype around UKIP. See, I because probably. they, I, I think, you know, we, could you imagine the next election, say UKIP formed a coalition with the Tories. Oh, because God, they got how possible. And Boris Johnson took over leadership of the Tory party, which I think he does want to do. Could you imagine yeah. like a country run by Boris and F Nigel? <laughs> God help us all, seriously. That would be the time to pack your bags, I reckon. You couldn't I mean, that's when you got to pack up and leave. I mean, that's the end of that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, we're bugging Seriously. if that happens. But it's very likely, though. It's very, very likely. It's not. It's not likely. I don't think. And because of our, because of our voting system, it, it would never happen because of our voting system. Our voting system is built to keep Labour and the Conservatives in power. UKIP got so much support because the European elections are fairer, because they go on a different voting system. Because mm. in this country, for instance, the with the the Tories or Labour, which one do you think will they will be most likely. I think it'll be a coalition. I don't think it'll it's going to be a Lib Dem Conservative coalition again. Yeah. Nothing's going to change because Ed Miliband has not. He just doesn't. He's just not a leader. No. I'm just sad to say that he's not a leader. Even though, frankly, out of the three, I'd prefer Labour to be no. in power, but it's just not going to happen. If if I had to pick one of the three, it'd have to be Labour or a Lib Dem Labour Conservative uh, coalition maybe, I don't know, but it's just not going to happen. But I mean UKIP, uh, or UKIP are going to get destroyed in the next general election simply because they don't have the same amount, they don't have an, an equal support around the whole country in all constituencies. They have masses of support yeah. in certain racist areas. And because the voting system... Oh. No, I was going to say that, that because the voting system does that, does that forces parties to have small amounts, small pockets of support all over the country. Because you can get elected with 20% of the vote. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, that, you, that it's so unfair, the way the whole, not every vote counts, every vote should count. And in the current system, it doesn't. Yeah, I mean, I remember my, I, I did a, um, t you can do a test online, which I think your vote power or something, where I remember seeing it, and my power, the vote, the power of my vote, where I'm in, is I think 0.25% of the equivalent of the rest of the UK. Just to say, because I'm in a solid Labour ward, then it's never going to change. I'm in a solid Tory ward. Yeah. And I don't think that's mm. going to change. They're bloody Muppets. But Tories always vote. That's the problem we've got. Yeah. So what do you think with the... the what, what coalition do you think would come in? Me? Yeah. I think probably a Tory Lib Dem. The way that might break down is we've started to see the nasty side coming out of the coalition in the run up to the election where they're dissing each other. Mm. Whether that does enough damage, because um, they have been quite nasty about Nick Clegg and he might have a bit of an ego, he might, he might go with Labour, but I doubt it. Mm. I mean, I don't know if Labour's going to get enough seats to make a government, that's the problem. I think what's going to happen is, actually, I mean, the most realistic of options, and I think the most interesting of options, is we may have two elections coming up quite close to each other in the sense that what I think may happen is the coalition might break down next election. They won't, they refuse to make a coalition with each other, and then that means that the Tories would have to lead with a minority government, which means that they would have to call an election a lot earlier. And maybe that would then mm. sway towards Labour. Mm. I think that could be quite interesting if that does happen. I, I, I have grave concerns about what we will have left if Tory get in again and also about Labour actually being any different to Tories because I think that they will keep half the Tory policies to be frank because the bad guys put them in but it would cost too much money to take it out. Mm, mm, and they're mm. you know when when it they is, see the I figures think... coming in you know, when they see old bedroom taxes bringing in X amount, this is bringing in that amount, you know, and they're, they're probably not going to want to cut it either. Mm. I mean, it's a sad fact, but I mean, the one thing I would say, though, that may change, if anything, is I doubt they, I doubt the, the, the Labour would, con would continue the privatisation of the NHS. No. Which, if you wanted an no. issue to vote for, and if oh. people were wondering what to vote for, I would suggest voting on, on the issue of the NHS. So, there wasn't it Tony Blair who first, it wasn't it Labour who first started these like private, private. contracts in the NHS? Wasn't it Labour yeah. that first started the privatisation of the NHS? It was Tony Blair, but one could argue that Ed Miliband and Tony Blair are two completely different people. Tony Blair was meant to be a Katori. I mean, let's be, let's, let's be 100% realistic about that, he was meant to be a Tory. I remember before he was elected, my auntie just used to say, he's the devil. He's <laughs> <laughs> the devil. <laughs> she's not eyes. mad or anything, but she just took an instant dislike to him. And every time he opened his mouth, she was like, no, I don't trust him. Mm. I mean, you can see why, though. I mean, yeah, I completely yeah. agree. 
brought us yeah. into war, isn't it? He's, he's done but his she, job. She's not political. You know what I mean? She's a, she's not political at all. She just hated him. <laughs> all right. Well, I mean, Dear, isn't it? each to it's their easy. own. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but some people are very good judging characters. People, some people read people's body languages very well. Yeah, I mean, he was. A, I mean, you can't deny there are some people that are genuinely evil in this world, and if you do believe in that, I think he come clo he comes close to it with his good friend Tony, with his good friend um, Bush. Yeah, yeah. definitely, they've done a Did lot. You hear of, of Switzerland? They declared a um, an arrest warrant for Bush. Did you hear that? Yeah. A while ago, when they um when Bush was on a state on not a state visit, on a personal visit to um Europe. When he went to Switzerland, he had to he had to literally run out the country because the Swiss police were after him. Switzerland announced that they were going to arrest him on crimes against There's humanity. There's a lot of warrants. There's a lot of warrants out for a lot of high-standing people in different countries. Even their own countries are against them. They are backed into a serious corner. The only thing you've got this little man in a suitcase going, "Let's fucking hope this holds together," because if not, we're all gone. <laughs> Yeah. And that is the point of it. If this doesn't hold together, they have not got a leg to stand on because they, you've got you have got warrants out for all of them, pretty much. The but I mean, people would devour them. I mean, if you remember and if you think back when banks first set up, when banks first set up and they started to do the mess that they did. I mean, banks were originally set up to keep people's gold and mm. silver when they needed it, and. At one point, banks started to lend more money on credit than they actually had. And, and this was obviously in the Middle East where banking first emerged. And after a while, people started to go and get slightly worried about it. And what happened was is that all the bank owners ended up getting their heads chopped off effectively because they didn't like it. And then banking got set back for quite some time and then it started to, to um, come back. And what's probably going to happen now, and the reason why water cannons are coming out and so forth, is because of that very reason that these people are scared. And I mean, they've, they have seen history. I'm pretty sure they have. Mm. They know what's coming if they don't manage to keep the system together. And this is why I said that the water cannons are actually a good sign. And that is a sign of a scared system so falling apart. Have a lot of the banker suicides, whatever you want to call them. Obviously, I'm, I'm not kind of sure on the nail gun being shot into himself 20-odd times is specifically what I would rule as a suicide. But... <laughs> Depending on how you view it, um, you you have got a fair amount of banker suicides that have, have had a high influx this year, really big. Well, I mean, their profession is now dangerous. Mm. You know, yeah. their profession you... is dangerous. Savages. Sorry, but that on a, low, way on a light, lighter note, do you remember Mary Poppins? I'm sure it's yes. Mary Poppins, where he <laughs> takes that kid into the bank. And he has to, they're all trying to get his penny on it. Oh, when yeah. I a, when I was a kid, that put me off going in a bank ever. <laughs> I was like, fuck that shit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I must have been about, I think I was probably about 16, and, and I had a job before I go into a bank. <laughs> I was thinking, they just want your money. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when I seen that film I, when I was a kid. I actually did. I actually did pretty much the same thing. I ended up keeping a lot of my um, little pennies and all sorts under the mattress most of the time. A little piggy bank, and keeping it. In a the lot bank. of the films depicted in that sort of era were about the corporations and the bankers. If you notice, they were all like the the chitty chitty bang bang child catch or whatever. It's like, oh God, there is. What evil. happened? Like, when did films become so brave, and when the hell did that die? Like some right. th these films were incredibly brave to come out with some well, of these things at the time. It's censoring as well. I don't know. Have you seen the um, not the nine o'clock news band edition? No. Um, Wave shared it the other day. Um, at the end, when the credits were going, they did a little sketch, and they went round with a big child catching net and caught a load of kids and bundled them into the back of a lorry, and then the lorry drove. I'm sorry, I'm going to laugh. And the lorry drove off, and on the side it said, Rolf Harris, Saturday morning show, whatever show he used to do. These kids were all like screaming. And you think, at the time, they made that. You know, whether it was just a coincidence and they were taking the piss out of um, kids not wanting to watch it, or whether it was, you know, the Something more sinister. being a, a dirty old man, you, you know, we won't know. But there have been a lot of things that maybe are more thought-provoking that are, are filtered away from us. 
Mm, I would say that this is again censorship. It's again of a yeah. paranoid system worrying because they don't know where to go from here. Look at it. You don't know how to go back, but um, yeah. We come to the end, guys. That's yeah. a good note to end. Yeah, let's censor ourselves. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, but, um, good. yeah, that was good. Yeah, so yeah you, good we'll chat. chat again next week. Next week, yeah. um, Thursday, as always. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Take care. Take bye. care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.